Namaste and greetings. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabha, Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend a warm welcome to you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a special talk on gender responsive climate finance, where we are and where we need to be by Ms. Leanne Shaltek as part of the series, State of Gender Equality, hashtag gender gaps. This discussion is being organized by IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center. The deliberation is being moderated by Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI. I invite Dr. Mehta to take the proceedings further and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahima. And a very good evening to everyone from India and good morning to friends and colleagues in the United States. Uh, climate finance is quite ambiguous in so far as what constitutes funding. And as a consequence, gender responsiveness of public climate finance provision is further pushed to the sidelines. So what needs to be done to chart the immediate, medium and long-term action plan, especially in the sustainable development goal era, wherein there is a comprehensive and equitable development for all. What is the Green Climate Fund and what is its role in channeling the financial flows? Should adaptation funding be prioritized for the least, developing, least developed countries and small island develop, uh, developing states? To delve into some of these very pertinent questions and beyond, I am delighted and honored to introduce our panel of specialists on gender responsive climate finance. Our speaker for the session is Ms. Leanne Schlattick, Associate Director of Henrik Boyle Stiftung, Washington, DC. Ms. Leanne is the Associate Director in the Washington DC office of Henrik Boyle Stiftung Foundation. It is a German political party foundation affiliated with the German Green Party with uh, 33 offices worldwide working on sustainable development, energy transition and climate change, democracy promotion, protecting civil society spaces as well as gender democracy. And at the foundation, Ms. Leanne spearheads its work on climate finance she has over 20 years of experience in global governance issues, specifically in international development and finance and international climate negotiations, as well as the protection of human rights, gender equality, women's empowerment, etc. And a particular interest of her work has been awareness raising and capacity building on the need to engender macroeconomic and finance policy. And she has her current, currently her work focuses on international climate finance with an emphasis on public climate finance flows and on equitable access to climate funding and specifically the Green Climate Fund. A process she has followed from its design process since 2011 onwards in all the GCF board meetings. And uh, we are so thankful ma'am that you were able to accept our invitation uh, this evening and speak on a very important and pertinent theme. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning. Our, uh, our discussants for the evening are Professor Mizan Ar Khan. He is the Deputy Director of International Center for Climate Change and Development, Independent University, Bangladesh. Sir is joining us from Dhaka. Uh, we have with us Dr. Sanghamitra Dhar. She is the Technical Coordinator of States, Gender Responsive Budgeting, at UN Women in Delhi and Manipur. And we have with us Ms. Marina Andrea Jivik. Uh, she is the PhD candidate at Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany, and also a guest researcher at Climate Analytics. So thank you so much to all our uh, esteemed panelists for the day. And uh, I welcome Ms. Leanne to make her presentation. Over to you, Ms. Leanne. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mita. And I wanted to uh, really um, send my appreciation to everybody listening in today and particularly to IMPRI, the Impact and Policy Research Institute in New Delhi for reaching out. This is a, a great honor and I'm pretty humbled and a little bit nervous, uh, but hopefully um, we'll have a very good discussion. 
Um, I will share, hopefully, without problems, um, my screen and dive right into it. Um, I have to warn everybody that my slides are usually a little bit detailed and I apologize for that, uh, but hopefully um, this allows them to be used as a resource afterward. Um, so um, I was asked to speak about gender responsive climate finance where we are and where we need to be. Um, I'm just seeing that for some reason I'm not able to advance the slide. Oh, now I am. I'm sorry, that was a little bit delayed. Um, just wanted to start out um, on talking a little bit about the gender dimension of climate change impacts and the issues of agency and voice without spending too much time, because I think a lot of the people here uh, in the discussion uh, will have engaged on, on, uh, on that issue uh, particularly. Uh, but um, uh, we, we are looking at the fact uh, that women and other marginalized gender groups are the majority of those living in extreme poverty, of the ones without access um, to clean energy, um, and still working with a lot of traditional um, biomass, cooking with traditional biomass, um, and where we have seen gains of the past decades uh, reversed by multiple intersecting crises. Uh, COVID crisis has made things uh, extremely worse uh, with, for example, extreme poverty for the first time in over 20 years, uh, shooting up in 2020. The international climate process has acknowledged that gender equality and the effective participation of women are relevant for all climate actions. And this is um, very important because women and marginalized gender groups are often disproportionately affected and um, due to persisting gender specific norms and gender class discriminations and barriers. And there's a long list of that. Um, all of it would really need a more in-depth discussion than we can provide here. Um, but they are related to the reproductive and unpaid, underpaid care work, the informality of work, the gender disaggregation, the gender differentiated work, the lack of access to finance and financial services, particularly the lack of access to information, illiteracy issues, lack of property, legal rights, and decision-making. At the same time, there are very differentiated capabilities to respond to climate change, and many women in many countries are already doing a lot to adapt to climate finance. However, that agency of women is often disregarded and underappreciated, and instead women are largely seen and sometimes exclusively as the victims um, through the impacts of climate change. So we need uh, gender responsive climate funds and funding processes. And there are um, uh, two very important reasons. First of all, it's the right thing to do and it's the right space thing to do. Those um, activities, funding activities, climate investments do not happen in a normative va uh, vacuum. Uh, the second one is it's an issue of equity, effectiveness and efficiency. How can we think that investments will be sustainable, will have lasting impact when we system, systematically include 50% of project program related actors or beneficiaries? Um, the good news is that over the past 10 years that we have seen significant process uh, in both uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in the way it has dealt with gender, but also in specific climate funds. So, for example, all the relevant multilateral climate funds now do have explicit gender policies and gender action plans, although um, the state of integration of mainstreaming efforts, the accountability uh, differs quite a bit and there's still quite a, a lot to do. Um, but negatively, and I think this is probably one of the core areas where we need to push forward, um, is the fact that um, there are continued structural impediments in, within those funds to actually women uh, women's groups, community groups, feminist organization, accessing some of the finance, um, and uh, they are not prioritized as by beneficiaries of the finance. Um, this is just meant to give you a little look about what the global climate finance architecture looks like, and this is actually just a very a rough and uh, schema. It's not even in detail with all of the actors. There is a majority of actors, and I will not be able to address all of them today. What I'm focusing on is the red circle part, 
which is a look at what the public dedicated multilateral climate funds have been doing or some of the issues that they are jointly facing. And then particularly looking at the role of the Green Climate Fund, which is an operating entity under the financial mechanism of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and of the Paris Agreement, and thus one of the most important multilateral implementing um, uh, um, entities, mechanisms, financing mechanisms for climate change. This slide, again, not going to be able to go into a lot of detail, is meant to give an overview over the gender responsiveness of climate finance, where we are, both within the UNFCCC setting, but also with the multilateral climate funds. Um, and as you can see, there has been quite some activity over the course of the last 10 years since the Cancun Agreement in 2010 acknowledged gender equality and effective participation of women as critical for all climate actions. Um, in the meantime, we have seen in the UNFCCC um, uh, Agenda Action Plan, the Lima Work Program, repeated work on that, commensurately again in the multilateral climate funds efforts to have progressively more integrated and better gender action plans and gender policies that are upgraded. However, and I think this is the problem, a lot of it is focused on um, those procedural improvements, uh, but we have relatively little um, uh, understanding of what is actually happening in implementation and at exit as those projects and programs that are invested and funded in. So that means um, there is quite a little um, accountability of how much money is actually flowing towards projects that also um, increase and enhance gender equality and what their impact has been. Now, uh, the, the issue, the overall issue of uh, having very little public accountability for the quality and quantity of gender related climate finance provided is a problem because there is very little tracking and data of that. Uh, basically, the most important one right now is the OECD DAC database with the marker system, both the Rio markers for, uh, for mitigation and adaptation, uh, but also the marker for gender equality. And if you cross relate that too, and this is the part that you can see here uh, with an overlap. Um, you actually come uh, for uh, the reporting of 2015 to 2016, and we would assume that has increased a little bit since then to only 8.6% of the total um, climate, uh, of total order that is both climate um, uh, related and gender related. Um, and you see how that then uh, distributes towards adaptation, mitigation, and cross cutting. Um, this is the reason why um, climate finance providers need to improve tracking and reporting on gender related aspects of climate finance, impact measuring and mainstreaming. And it's very good that this uh, for the first time was explicitly pulled up and lifted up as a message in the Standing Committee of Finance by annual report. Uh, on climate finance flows. And again, that was the first time that gender actually made an appearance in that very seminal work um, that has a lot of, um, a lot of respect um, in, in the world about uh, how well developed countries are helping fulfill um, the mandate of supporting developing countries in support of their climate action. Um, this slide looks really um, uh, a little bit more in depth, um, and this is uh, from uh, Oxfam's climate, uh, climate Finance Shadow Report last year on how much of the funds, kind of the overlap of the funds, the climate-related order that also addresses gender equality issues uh, does what, and as some of you might know, in, in the order um, uh, in the OECD DAC uh, system, there is a difference between significant and principal um, uh, purpose of funding. Um, we find out that only about a third of climate finance projects and programs um, designed respond, uh, are designed to respond to gender differentiated needs, which means obviously commensurately two thirds of projects and programs either don't screen or don't think gender equality is an important objective for climate interventions. And of those only 1.5% uh, of climate related order identify gender equality as primary um, objective. What is missing there, and there is no reporting requirement for this, is reporting 
or accounting of how much is being spent at the local level, although there are some estimates that it might be less of 10% of, for example, the multilateral um, dedicated climate funds funding. Um, and also developed countries at the moment do not include data on gender when they report in their biennial reports um, to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, why is the gender responsiveness of climate finance so important? Um, we are trying to look at a couple of examples um, in, in uh, mitigation, where when, when looks at a renewable energy, um, there is an important role for the private, private sector, uh, for the public sector climate financing to address of some of the misperceptions of risk and return. Uh, but we have the problem that a lot of the public finance provision to renewable energy is very often biased towards large scale solutions. And there is a primacy towards energy provision for commercial over household activities. This under uh, this basically underappreciates and does not address sufficiently very often issues of energy poverty, the affordability of access, the need for cross subsidization uh, that we need to see in order to make sure that renewable energy solutions, for example, with distributed renewable energy mini grids are gender responsive. Um, instead, very often there is a focus on big infrastructure investment. It's also very important to point out that there are false solutions that can violate women's human rights, such as, for example, when you look at large hydro dams or a discourse about biofuel, which uh, its impact on food security and food sovereignty items. Um, for the public sector, the adaptation focus um, I think it's really important, and this is where the issue is not just a technical issue, but a political issue, to put the uh, discourse about gender responsive climate finance into the overall need to not only um, increase the amount of climate finance provided to developing countries significantly, but to increase the funding for adaptation significantly, and to do that in a way that we get to a balanced adaptation uh, mitigation uh, funding spending, which we currently do not, with the exception of the Green Climate Fund, which does have a 50-50 grant equivalent financing allocation mandate, and that we continue to provide adaptation finance primarily as grant financing and including as full cost grant financing. Why is this important? We've seen um, again and again, and for example, the GCF, uh, the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility focus uh, quite a bit on incremental cost financing. That very often leads in implementation, adaptation in implementation on the count for locally led adaptation to an artificial dividing line and diver differentiation between development and adaptation. It leads, for example, in the Green Climate Fund to the requirement to provide a climate rationale with sufficient data, um, um, not taking into account that in many contexts, the data availability might not be there. Um, and it also needs um, to um, uh, uh, some reluctance to, for example, fund for social protection programs or cash transfer models as part of adaptation financing. Um, and instead, um, uh, just focus more on infrastructure related adaptation. What we need then is increasing uh, enhanced to enhance direct access, devolved climate financing models, such as national or subnational small grants facility approaches, and there are already a number of them. Uh, for example, the best known is the Jeff UNDP small grants program. The Adaptation Fund and the Green Climate Fund also have programs. However, um, importantly, that needs to be upscaled um, and it needs to be um, made um, more easily accessible uh, for direct access entities in both, for example, the Adaptation Fund and the, and the Green Climate Fund. Private sector largely, I think there the key is focusing on gender responsive micro, small and medium sized enterprises. And um, it's particularly important uh, because you see a lot of discourse about small and medium sized enterprises to not forget the micro. That part, because as you can see from the breakdown here, this is where women's entrepreneurs are disproportionately uh, located. Um, many of them in the informal sector focused on uh, service provision and not necessarily on contributing to manufacturing supply change. And their biggest challenge is um, 
uh, access to finance, and that includes, for example, small scale farmers. And so it's very important that public climate funds um, make sure that when they provide, for example, in, um, in small grants or small, uh, sorry, small loans or, or, or micro loan um, uh, projects funding for those groups, that the concessionality is passed on to women entrepreneurs as end consumers. Uh, and that subsidy capture by the intermediary, by the commercial bank, the local financial institution that receives that funding is actually avoided. And that can be done, for example, by ensuring that you have risk uh, guarantees for small scale loans, which might uh, reduce the need or for or the size of the collateral, which is a problem that many women who don't hold land ownership titles are dealing with, or it buys down the interest rate and increases the maturity, the length of uh, those loans. Lastly, it's important there also to have public grant finance provision uh, for the capacity building of loan offices and the provision of non-financial services to address gender specific climate finance knowledge gaps that we have in those sectors and particularly with local financial institutions. Um, quick introduction um, to the Green Climate Fund. Hopefully I have enough time to go into some um, of, the, of the discourses here. Um, uh, you can see here from the portfolio dashboard um, uh, what the Green Climate Fund has been up to. It has committed close to 9 billion for 177 projects. It is the largest multilateral fund. Um, it also has a mandate to support the paradigm shift in recipient countries by supporting low emission and climate resilient development pass lines. And it works with a who of who of climate finance implementers with its now 113 implementing partners, which has most of the, it has all of the MDBs, has um, UN agencies, has a lot of commercial banks. Um, I just wanted to give a quick snap because I thought that uh, probably uh, for our audience um, in India, that might be interesting to see what the current GCF funding support is in India, where we have four projects. Um, you see them listed there and also two activities under readiness and preparatory support, uh, which is a very important component of funding in the Green Climate Fund and also funding that can help in improving the gender responsiveness of its funding. And I want to point out in particularly one of the last projects that was approved, the India Green Cross Equity Fund, which is a private sector uh, equity fund. And um, as I mentioned briefly here, uh, um, going into equity funds, into private sector leveraged funding, into intermediation funding is something um, that we see increasingly in climate finance and particularly in the Green Climate Fund through the public funds. And that has a lot of transparency and out of, uh, accountability challenges uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, gender responsive climate finance. Also the added uh, difficulties that a lot of the private sector actors have are not necessarily conversant or focus on gender equality outcomes. And so they are tracking and accountability, all of which is made more difficult um, through some of the proprietary information and related disclosure issues are more difficult. So the GCF has had a mandate um, from the very beginning and it was the first fund to do so to integrate gender as an objective and guiding principles. It has um, in its governing instrument and I think the fact that this is actually enshrined in the governing instrument um, it is, is a result of the very early engagement of gender experts and gender advocates in the design process for the Green Climate Fund. It has a number of um, gender considerations uh, enshrined in its governing instrument, the gender sensitive approach and its section on objectives and guiding principles. This little coda, which was almost added like an afterthought, is core important because it anchors the gender responsiveness mandate as a cross-cutting issues across the fund. It asks for gender balance as a goal for the board and secretariat, um, highlights the gender aspects of stakeholder engagement, and points out that women are a crucial group for input and participation in the design, decision on, and implementation of strategies and activities of the fund. Uh, the GCF, like the other um, dedicated multilateral climate funds that I mentioned, has an updated uh, uh, policy and gender action plan. Um, uh, 
when it was updated just recently, just in October 2019, this was after several years of back and forth um, in, in, in trying um, to Im further improve an initial gender action plan, but also acting, and I think this is also important to acknowledge, receiving quite a bit of pushback against the widened mandate of the GCF gender policy. Um, so it was, for example, not able to include a non-binary gender approach or intersectionality considerations in the policy. Uh, there are some pros to the new policy. It strengthens and details some of the procedural requirements for implementation. Uh, for example, that it's now mandatory uh, for every project proposal that comes forward to have a gender assessment and a commensurate gender action plan. Um, it also provides, and that's very crucial, more support for the accredited entities, particularly direct access entities and the national designated authorities, which are the counterpart of the fund on the country level, the ones that also has to issue the no objection to projects to counter the perception that gender is used as a conditionality for access and could be used for restricting access. But, and this is some weakness of the policy, um, at least the gender advocates, and I feel that it really does undermine uh, the concept of the universality of human rights and its commitment um, because the mandates within the policy are not clear enough. It uh, lacks, for example, detailed international human rights referencing and framing. It shied away from providing uh, definitions and most importantly, it uses the language of national contextualization, uh, basically saying that gender equality mandates have to be seen in the context of national policies um, and national cultural experiences, which obviously undermines um, a universality approach uh, to women's um, human rights. Now, how does the gender mainstreaming in the GCF uh, look like? Um, again, the important part there is not just relying on a gender policy and a gender action plan, but making sure that those mandates are integrated into a whole range of operational policies, guidelines, and procedures. Um, so for example, in the Green Climate Fund, as in other funds, there is a requirement now for accreditation um, that applicants that want to get accredited with the fund show the competency, the capacity, and the existence of an own gender policy. Um, this has been very challenging for a lot of the commercial banks that want to work as implementing partners with the Green Climate Fund, many of which for the first time were through that engagement basically forced to develop their own gender policy. Um, it accounts um, uh, for gender and climate change in results uh, measurement, uh, sorry, in results management and performance measurement frameworks to a request for gender and sex disaggregated data. Um, it provides some funding for readiness and for project preparation. It asks and reports uh, for reporting on um, uh, how the gender um, action plan on the project and pro program level is implemented for the annual uh, performance report. And it also asks countries and entities when they develop their work programs uh, for funding priorities with the Green Climate Fund to highlight how gender is integrated there. Um, important is uh, the GCF investment framework. All of the projects are, um, are judged against this, including by the ITAP, the Independent Technical Advisory Panel. Um, one of the six main criteria, the sustainable development uh, uh, potential, are specifically for gender sensitive development impacts. However, this is not required reporting for all projects and programs, unfortunately. Um, we also see that, for example, the Independent Technical Advisory Panel uh, very inconsistently evaluates um, uh, the gender sensitive development impacts of proposal in the Green Climate Funds, which has, partial, it has partially to do with the lack of sufficient gender expertise and capacity within the technical advisory uh, body pointing out again that it's not just important to, for example, have a gender expert on the fund, but make sure that the gender expertise is very widely shared with specific technical panels or um, advisory committees. Um, GCF gender uh, integration, what data points can tell and what they can't. Um, I think it's very easy 
uh, to look at some procedural compliance. So like, for example, the fact that 95% of approved projects have provided gender assessments. Again, this is mandatory under the GCS policy or that 78% of the approved projects have provided sex disaggregated data. Again, that should be a 100% as it's mandatory under the policy or the fact that 89% have been able to provide gender action plans. And again, under the updated gender policy of the GCF, this is mandatory, but it doesn't really tell us that much yet. It just provides for the potential for quality at entry, procedure quality, but it doesn't tell us anything yet of what the implementation and the outcomes um, is looking like. And this is overall a problem that we see with all of the climate funds that a lot of the compliance focus is on the quality at entry with not commensurate um, attention um, and detail given and accountability provided for the quality at implementation and particularly the gender equality outcomes of funded climate intervention at access. I also want to point out uh, the issue of the gender balance in the secretariat. The secretariat does there a lot better than the GCF board, which only despite its mandate um, to strive towards gender balance had five women or 21% of its uh, members being female. Um, and the GCF unfortunately lags there behind other multilateral funds. Also, again, uh, just looking at gender balance doesn't tell us everything. Uh, for example, while the GCF secretariat has a relatively balanced um, uh, um, male-female ratio, uh, it does not tell us that a lot of the females are support staff, meaning in lower capacity positions and not necessarily um, uh, uh, to the same extent represented in the technical staff. And those are all issues where, again, there, we come to a limit um, of the numbers. So how does the gender integration in the GCF portfolio look like? What works, what doesn't? Um, again, um, uh, gender specific assessment and action plan is mandatory for all proposals. This looks at the quality at entry, as I mentioned, but very often even there, we see some significant shortcomings. Very often a gender action plan is only a list of activities, but without clear indicators, responsibilities, or assigned budget, and where a budget is assigned, it's often very, very low. And so, for example, could be easily taken up uh, by um, uh, costs for one um, gender consultant. Uh, we also have the problem, and that's the next one, that a lot of the activities related to that are outsourced to consultant and are not reflecting, for example, gender expertise and a core gender understanding within the program implementation unit by the implementing entities. So that leaves them with no internal learning. And this is exactly um, a, a big problem also because the implementing entity um, is also overseeing and should provide guidance to other partners that they have in implementation on the local level. Very often it's also treated as an add-on of activities, but not sufficiently integrated into the overall project design, including in the budget, including in the indicators. So this is a, this is a big problem. And then uh, lastly, as I already men mentioned, there is little accountability for quality and implementation. And so far, uh, that has also to do with the fact that the GCF has no completed project so far uh, for quality at access. So some of the core issues um, to address, and I think, again, a lot of those are transferable, is again, continued technical input and gendered analysis of seemingly unrelated policies. And this relates, for example, to the adequacy um, uh, of financial instrument, uh, protecting grants, talking about the right level of concessionality and co-financing requirements, pushing back on the artificial dividing line between development and adaptation, particularly for locally led adaptation and community-based adaptation efforts. Um, improving overall projects, approval processes, increasing transparency and accountability, particularly for those intermediated projects for financing facilities set up under the funds or for programmatic approaches, increased gender expertise across the different um, functions and responsibilities, the advisory panels, the accreditation panel, um, and um, the senior level management. And then also, and I think this is an important one, not shying away to really saying 
um, for an activity. If you are not taking gender serious, then you are not ready for funding. The adaptation fund is so far the only uh, fund that has a very clear um, a message in its gender policy that it says it will not consider any project that has not uh, sufficiently integrated gender. Um, so the board has, has made that commitment there. This has to happen across the funding spectrum. And that also means that we should not shy away from, for example, bringing in uh, gender related covenants in term sheets or funded activity agreements. And lastly, for the recipient country level, there is also quite a bit of work to do. The NDAs, the national designated authorities, those that are interacting with the funds need to approve their own gender capacities and understanding uh, so that they actually can influence and shape the gender responsiveness of country programs, uh, the national adaptation plans, the NDCs, all of which are basically the background for the uh, funded activities. Um, the accredited entities need to strengthen their own in-house gender capacities. And this is particularly true for direct access entities in, in developing countries receiving funding because we wanna see a lot more capacity come through direct access. Uh, we need to um, encourage uh, local women's group uh, and gender group to engage with all of those players in, in climate fin finance um, to offer, for example, their capacity also as executing entities, um, uh, existing women's funds or existing women's organizations are often very capable of implementing specific program or project components or segments, but very often not thought of as partners and implementations. And then again, it's critical to monitor um, proposed an approved project and also not to shy away from challenging implementation, for example, through redress mechanism, if things go horribly array. Um, so with that, I stop. Um, I'm fearing that I might have gone over time. I really appreciate everybody's interest and I'm very curious um, to hear the comments and the questions um, of our participants. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I personally thoroughly enjoyed it and it was uh, such an eye opening, uh, the, the data and the statistics that you provided. I have really noted a lot of um, uh, notes and also questions in case we have time towards the end, I'd like to pose them to you. Thank you so much again. Uh, so I take the liberty of moving eastwards from uh, uh, United States. And I would like to invite Ms. Marina Andriavic to make her presentation as a discussion. Thank you so much, Ms. Marina. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Thank you, um, Leanne, for the, for the presentation. This, I also really learned a lot and enjoyed it. Um, I'm also, I've got, my input is about five minutes, but I've also got a short PowerPoint that I would like to, to share, you should be able to see my screen fully right now. Um, so thanks for the introduction. I'm a, I'm a PhD candidate at the Humboldt University in Berlin and a research analyst at Climate Analytics in Berlin, which is also an independent um, policy and um, research think tank on climate change. Um, I am here today because because I'm engaged or some of my research relates to to gender equality in in the climate research environment and I will in very brief terms talk about a paper of mine that was published some time ago um, titled like this presentation so overcoming gender inequality for climate resilient development and this probably some of you listening here or the panelists will also find some relationships between mine and, and Leanne's presentation here in so far that I'm going to come in from the angle of trying to draw attention to the importance of accounting for gender inequality in the research domain. So, so Leanne came very much from the policy perspective and the need to incorporate these considerations in particularly in the GCF world, but um, I don't know if you'll be surprised to learn that we in climate change research, so we, we are aware of these connections, but we are missing the um, operational aspect of accounting for gender inequality in, 
in areas such as climate impact modeling, which is um, tools that we use when we talk about um, impacts of climate change on societies in the year 2050, 2100, and so on. So um, we've already heard from, from Leanne th what the key connections are between climate change and gender equality. And this, these were, I'm just going to show two figures from my paper that really back this, this theoretical connection with empirical data. So this is on the one hand, the relationship between an index of gender inequality and an index of climate vulnerability. And you see a very linear relationship between the two. So the more gender unequal an environment is, the more climate vulnerable it is as well. This doesn't, of course, tell us about the exact mechanisms that are at play here, but it does show a very straightforward connection. But, and, and as Leanne mentioned, there are many, many, um, interactions in, in which women are disempowered and many societal norms that prevent women from access to resources um, such as financial resources, informational, educational, and so on. But this is, I think it's very important to stress that there's nothing inherently vulnerable about women uh, per se. This is really social structures that make women vulnerable in, in, in this climate sense of climate change. Um, but an, another dimension, which isn't as linear as this one, is that areas with lower gender inequality tend to score better on an indicator of climate action. So this is more the mitigation perspective, climate action being um, action on reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, there are many other factors in place. These tend to be wealthier countries, um, more, less, less industry intensive and so on. And there are many different reasons, but I, in, in our paper, we also wanted to bring in this angle that it's not only um, vulnerability to climate change where we need to stress this interconnection, but also the, the women's agency in, in climate action. So these were these. This was the framing of the paper that then we used to to carry on with providing um, quantitative projections of of how gender equality might look like in the future as part of the socioeconomic shared socioeconomic scenarios or shared socioeconomic pathways which is a set of scenarios that we commonly use in climate change research when we talk about how might the societies of the future look like. And I used an existing index from the UNDP, which is quite a basic reflection of gender inequality. This is what the world map looks like. Um, it's, um, we could discuss now how, um, how robust this index really is, but um, these are the components that go into it. So it's, it's maternal um, health and adolescent birth rate as, as a reflection of health. Then there's representation of women in parliament and in secondary education as an indicator of empowerment. And then female um, labor force participation. So these three components go into something called gender inequality index. So it's, it's a reflection of quite basic inequalities between, between men and women. And by showing the multiple interactions, both with, with vulnerability and, and with mitigation, we try to draw attention to, to the importance of considering gender inequality in adaptive capacity. So this, we were kind of giving it exactly this climate rationale that Leanne was, was talking about, but in research. So, in, so when we talk about future climate impacts, so we talk about an extreme event from climate change and we talk about a society of the future that might meet these, these future climatic conditions. Um, we wanted to say that because gender inequality affects capacity to adapt to climate change, it needs to be taken into account when we're planning for how capable might future societies be to protect or to adapt to climate change? So um, 
these these projections that I'm talking about look like this. So we published the paper in Nature Communications um, earlier this year. And here you have a regional aggregation of, of how this index might look like in the future. And without me going into the details of these scenarios, so I'm not sure how familiar the audience will be with them, but they're, they're meant to represent a very broad spectrum of plausible futures um, on, on population development, on income development, and so on. And um, we expanded these scenarios with this indicator of gender inequality. And the point of this graph is to show that it, um, of course, there's a lot of space for maneuver in terms of how future societies might look like with respect to, to gender inequality. And the green line is um, would show the more progressive societies of uh, the more progressive socioeconomic development, which are scenarios of um, fast improvements in female education in particular, which would um, greatly contribute to lowering gender inequality and that there is, there would be a big difference already in the year 2030, 2050 in, in, in the African continent, in small island developing states, in, in South Asia as well, based on this indicator. Um, and that this must be taken into account when we're planning for, for our future um, adaptive capacity and, and climate resilient development. So I would leave it here to not go too over time. This was a really a brief um, snapshot of, of the paper, but I'm happy to, to take questions later on this or on anything that might have been unclear or brushed over. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Marina. Very, very interesting, the last slide especially. So uh, we'll come back to you with questions. So thank you uh, again. And I would now invite Dr. Sangamitra Dhar for uh, her remarks. Now, over to you. Am I out of it? Yes, you are. Good evening. Yes. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Leanne, for the interesting presentation and sharing the outlook of GCF. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that uh, you have positioned your presentation on uh, basically centering it around gender responsive strategies and not just limit, limiting it to gender sensitive elements alone, which is very, very refreshing because uh, most of the time this nuanced understanding is missing in most of the gender discussion. So thank you for that. And uh, I, I totally agree that there is a, a absence of uh, sex disaggregated data in the developing countries on various uh, critical indicators um, across across uh, uh, themes actually. So yeah, climate of course is uh, a critical part of it. So I do understand that data driven uh, change strategies or for that matter, uh, participatory change strategies also are a, a much required necessity in today's planning and uh, financing uh, conversation. I just have a small query. What are, uh, like uh, when you are talking, uh, when you are saying that uh, we are very uh, uh, mandated on having a gender element in the uh, funding consideration, so how do you highlight the geolocal realities? And on that, what kind of gender responsive planning or financing elements do you uh, bring into the conversation? Do you have a framework of, of uh, understanding that and uh, assessing ar around that? So that is my query to you. And Mariana, all the best for your PhD. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really, very really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, your quick uh, questions and also your discussions. Uh, I would now invite Professor Mizan R. Khan uh, to make his remarks. So, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Simi. Yes. Yeah. Since uh, I have another background in the sense of being a long time negotiator with the Bangladesh delegation for, the, for almost last 20 years, uh, and following climate finance, 
in the UNFCCC process. So I'll start my comments with uh, primary finance in general. Uh, Leon, you have lived up to my expectation as kind of an authority on climate finance. Uh, in my student days, even when I got into this process uh, of climate finance, I started reading your uh, literature on climate finance fundamentals and all those. So again, welcome. We might have met in some COPs, I think. Anyway, so uh, you, uh, your presentation is so detailed, so comprehensive that uh, little is really left for me to comment. Anyway, I will start a few comments with the overall climate finance. You all know that climate finance is different from overseas development assistance. Industrial countries under the convention, uh, under Article 4.3 and 4.4, .4 have assumed obligatory responsibility uh, to provide new and additional adequate and predictable financing. And one of the convention is on the common but differentiated responsibility based on respective capabilities. But industrial countries don't accept to the responsibility part. They more agree to capability part that they have uh, better capabilities in terms of uh, technology and finance. So they will be ready. They are ready to help us. But climate finance is not charity. It's our right because this adaptation is a burden imposed on us by major emitters. And now the, when we use the word major emitters, then there is another problem. When in 92, this convention started, the emission contribution was 70, 30, 70 by developed countries, around 41 uh, annex one country, and 30% only by developing countries, including China and India. But the pendulum has changed, reversed totally. Now, 65, more than 65% is done by developing countries, and one third is by developed countries. And India is, the, is in the most difficult position in climate diplomacy, because as a, an independent country, India is the third largest emitter after China, contributing to global you now 26% and America around 14, 15%. Uh, and then uh, India's plus comes, I think, about seven or eight percent globally. But in India, still, per capita emission is absolutely uh, low compared to those uh, big emitters. In the, but anyway, developed countries must take the lead. That has been accepted under the Paris Agreement, also under 9.1, uh, with the language shall means obligatory. But now, then since Copenhagen. Uh, for first to start finance, there is a $30 billion and $100 billion, this uh, uh, totemic figure, what uh, the British COP president uh, now uses that uh, word, totemic figure of $100 billion. As Leon has showed that Oxfam study, OECD study shows in 2018 that $79 billion provided, but Oxfam uh, shadow report deflated it down three times uh, about uh, maximum 20, 22 billion dollars net climate finance. So there is kind of a Himalayan gulf between the claim delivery and the actual receipts on the ground. And so there is double, triple, quadruple counting. This Rio marker is not respected and uh, even 10 or $20 out of $100 is if it, uh, provided as climate finance as principal, uh, then it is uh, written across all the Rio conventions in every project. So this is, there is serious, serious overcounting. Now I'll refer just to two uh, aspects. The numbers 80, 20, is about mitigation and adaptation. 20% only goes to adaptation, but the funding agencies, developed partners, including the GCF, have pledged to do a balance 50 50. And 50% of the adaptation money to go to the particularly vulnerable countries, which mostly includes uh, LDCs and the small island developing states. Now, these LDCs get about 20% of 
total adaptation finance, and seats get only 3%. Uh, and the other 80-20 number relates to loan versus grants. Now, more and more money, uh, climate finance goes as uh, provided as loans. 80% is loan, only 20% as grants. And even for the case of uh, developed countries, about 66% is loan. Only one third is about grants. So this is absolute climate injustice because these uh, impacts are imported, imposed on us. Uh, we are not uh, uh, responsible. I call LDCs or most of the small island developing states as nano emitters. I use this word uh, in my book, uh, first book published by Routless from London and New York in 2014, nano emitters. But still, and another tragedy is, you see, so this loan part is making us another, creating another climate debt trap. Already these developing countries, even the low-income countries, are in huge debt traps. And COVID-19 has reinforced that, you know, debt burden. Now, again, climate uh, finance, addressing climate actions is again, through loans, is uh, adding uh, fuel uh, to the fire. This is another aspect I want to mention, then I'll move to gender. Another aspect is, well, there is a clear cut difference between ODA and climate finance, as I mentioned. But there is a problem that adaptation and development cannot really be differentiated in most of the cases, though there are standalone adaptation pro uh, projects. But often adaptation and development difference get, uh, gets blurred. That is why we define adaptation as kind of development in adverse climate. So this uh, ODA and uh, climate finance really cannot be differentiated uh, in a strict sense. But now increasingly what happens, increasingly overseas the ODA, which is meant for provision of uh, basic services to the poor in developing countries and building basic infrastructure, now is diverted as climate finance, where there is developed countries view more of mutual interests. Okay, now um, on the one side, ODA climate finance, climate related ODA goes up increasingly, Leon knows very well and she does research on this, increasingly ODA, a part of ODA goes up. The tragedy is ODA, overall ODA going down. At least if, for example, ODA would have gone up and ODA climate finance part also would have gone up, then we could see at least there are some kind of sense, some kind of sanity. But um, uh, as a negotiator, climate fund, I'm absolutely frustrated. I call these kind of uh, negotiations as a process of active inaction. This word also I used in my another book published again by uh, MIT Press. Uh, just let me share in one minute one story. In 2015, I was in the negotiation room in Paris for negotiating the climate uh, uh, new regime. Then when the OECD uh, delegate mentioned that in 2014, uh, industrial countries have provided $62 billion in 2014, then instantly the Indian delegate raised the flag and so based on their research in India that they find only $2.2 billion as climate finance. So you see there is an order of magnitude. And so there is huge, huge lack of trust in, and the root problem is that still we don't know which money should be called climate finance. Because over this last quarter century, still we couldn't agree to define what climate finance is. And that is where this wiggle room for subjective interpretation by the developed countries, you know, uh, rests on. Uh, so uh, just three days back, I attended a, a LDC developing country negotiation of the COP presidency. There I loudly 
mentioned that there is no sense of absolute uh, looking for absolute numbers because under Paris Agreement by 2025, we have to have a new uh, quantified goal taking $100 billion as placed by developed countries back in 2010 uh, to 2009 uh, uh, as the floor. So um, there is now negotiations about the new quantified goal. I strongly argue that there is no sense of the absolute number. It might be $200 billion. But if we don't agree to what is climate finance, what dollar we can call is as climate finance. There's no sense of absolute uh, amount, value of absolute amount, but this is not achieved yet. And industrial countries uh, manipulate, you know, they manipulate. Just you can see natural climate change. The uh, one piece we have published, I am a co-author with Professor Timon Sravarsa Brown University on uh, these accounting, creative accounting modalities published in Nature Climate Change. You can uh, look at that. Now coming to uh, the gender aspect, I'm, I, I, Dr. Sidney, I'm taking more time. I'll finish soon. Okay. Mm. Just, in, just in two, three minutes, I'll finish. Now coming to the gender part, Absolutely. Leanne has so elaborately shared all these nitty gritties of information. I have not much to say. Gender, gender, vulnerability, adaptive capacity, even migration or access to institutions, legal redress are all gendered that Leanne has clearly mentioned. And then second point she mentioned, I 100% agree, there is no lack of evidence on the efficacy of uh, gender-led programs. There are ample evidence that where women lead, we get results better than not. Just let me give the example of BRAC or Grameen Bank. Who is Dr. Yunus? Who made him the way he is today? Or who is Dr. Fazle Hassan, no, not Dr. Sar Fazle Hassan Abed? It is only the rural women who made them. It is the rural women who achieved the Nobel Prize uh, uh, through Grameen Bank, uh, not Dr. Yunus himself, because it is the, those rural women who made those figures, you know, um, as global figures. So we have to agree. And now uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, this uh, EDA, GCF or Adaptation Fund are progressive institutions relative to other multilateral funding agencies. So uh, EDA, uh, this expedited direct access facility. Just three days back, I was a panelist at the GCF second pilot uh, phase, where I strongly argued that if you really want to uh, implement your paradigm shift, that is the one of the investment criteria, then you have to invest more for locally led adaptation. And in locally led adaptation, you have to kind of uh, fund more to sub-national funding agencies, because our countries largely are centralized. So some national level direct access entity does not allow funds to be accessed directly by the local communities. That is why these I are good for that uh, ZCF should have a facility, a small grant facility to regularize. They have started with a $200 million pot for piloting 10 projects, $20 million each. So that will take a few years for learning. But this a small grants facility should be a part of the GCF. And once they allow a small national implementing entities, not this big national uh, uh, direct access entities, then only um, women. Because once women have at, at their disposal some pots of money, as Lian has mentioned through social protection schemes or some other schemes, then they can really, because money is power, money can uh, you know, be invested by better by women and capacity building is absolutely needed. And there we need to focus more on uh, giving training first in mother language, because those women don't know English very well. That is, once they can conceptualize things in their own language, then translation can be done in English. So I, I took much time, most probably, than an allocator, too. So I will stop here. Yeah? 
Uh, thank you very much again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very, very interesting points you have raised. I'm really grateful. Uh, so I would now uh, request Ms. Leanne to respond if uh, that's okay with you, ma'am. Yes, thank you very much um, to all the commentators. I, I think deeply illuminating and, and um, actually I think it, it provided a wonderful synergetic view um, at, the, at the larger uh, problem that we are trying to address, um, how to make gender equality really and gender equality outcomes really an, an, an a central, a core consideration of climate interventions. And in the case of Marina, um, as she highlighted, also of um, climate projections and the related uh, policy actions and strategies that are currently being developed um, with those projections in mind. So I'm deeply um, grateful to Marina uh, to pointing out um, what is actually happening or not happening with lack of um, you know, integration of sufficient considerations of gender equality in some of those um, uh, projections, climate projections. And it's uh, great that her work and the work of others actually pushes that forward. That goes back to the notion of the climate rationale. Um, and again, I, I think as important as all those climate projections are, they and the scientific data is, they should not be used as an impediment um, or a restriction to deny access to certain activities right now. This is uh, what Professor Khan has mentioned, what I have mentioned, the, the very hard differentiating line between development and adaptation for locally led actions that actually address uh, the most uh, horrible and, and aggravating climate impacts already. And it's, for example, impossible um, to ask um, for a locally led adaptation project that is dealing with increasing uh, with increasing um, droughts and the availability of, of, of rainfalls um, and is asking for support from a climate fund to provide data in a sufficiently detailed manner for the local context that would really clearly identify of whether you know, the reduction in rainfall is a climate uh, a weather variability or it's the direct result of climate change. And that is nonsense. It's nonsense because it's not needed to fund a gender responsive action on the ground that deals with those matters and deals that in a way that puts human rights and people at the center. So scientific data the climate rationale should be supportive, but not prohibitive of those kind of actions um, that we see. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very personally very passionate because I have seen and the, the discourse, for example, in the Green Climate Fund board at the last board the meeting was very much about that, how in many cases the insufficient um, access to data or the insufficient availability of data can be used as an excuse not to go forward with actions that we know that are working on the differentiation of incremental costs. And it's all, as a matter of fact, it does not come down to action. It comes down to who is supposed to pay for that. And this is actually what the incremental cost approach does because it assumes a development, a development baseline and then the additional funding by climate funds just for the climate related component. And again, I don't think that works in locally led adaptation and it should not be an impediment. Um, uh, Dr. Dar's um, point about the sex um, disaggregated data that it's missing, um, that we need a lot more of that, that is really important to highlight that is crucial and it's particularly crucial. And that's why I think it's so important that there is that mandate for project development in most climate funds to have that comprehensive gender assessment. And that comprehensive gender assessment really means going 
looking at what data is available, but going far beyond a desk review. It's not enough to look at the UN Women's Report about the gender situation in a specific country or get some existing data. It really means engaging with the communities, having those interviews and field studies in the local language and not just in the English language or in another of the main languages to really get to the core of what the differentiated needs of men and women and other marginalized groups are in the specific local setting. And then put that, um, develop the baseline, develop the data that you have for that, which you then need if you set targets and projected actions um, to be able to double check, you know, with the outcomes of actually whether you have made some progress. So the development of the baseline data is important. And this is the requirement so that you then in collecting sex aggregated data throughout the implementation can come to an understanding of whether you not only had a climate impact overall, but had a climate impact that contributed to gender equality and that addressed some of the hurdles that we see um, in basically gender responsive implementation. So this is really important um, and, um, and I completely agree with you. And then lastly, Professor Khan, thank you so much. You provided uh, so much of the context um, by putting of climate justice, of climate finance delivery. And I would add to it, um, it's not just climate justice that needs to be done, but it also needs to be gender just. So gender justice and climate, finance, uh, climate justice are inseparable and should be inseparable, including with delegations and developing country delegations in the negotiation of climate uh, finance discourses in the UNFCCC, where we don't necessarily always see a sufficient support by climate finance negotiators on the importance and acknowledgement of uh, acknowledging um, that that needs to be done in a, in, a, in a gender responsive way. I completely agree with you. The Rio markers are problematic and it's very sad that in this day and age, this is the best available data that we have. As um, uh, Dr. Khan knows, and um, uh, there is a lot of ongoing work in the UNFCCC on better accounting as part of the Paris Agreement implementation on trying to account better for climate finance provided with more granularity. And, and this is the important part in a comparable way, because right now the Rio markers are really not comparable because it's largely the developed country itself that determine on what criteria it uses, you know, for example, a designation of um, a specific action as significant or, or principally um, contributing to either gender or climate adaptation and mitigation. And that leads to a huge uncareability and to the inflation um, of overall um, accounting, over accounting that Professor Khan has pointed out. I'm also very grateful that you pointed out the issue of the increasing provision of climate finance as loans. This is a gender issue, and it's very important to state that, because if developing countries only receive an, an ever larging share of mandated climate finance provision as loans, which are repayable, this obviously clouds where they are willing to invest that money, because for a loan, you need to have a return on investment in order to pay back the investment. And this is very often antithetical to some of the local public goods provision that we need to do to do gender responsive climate change implementation, uh, where very often there is not a clear financial return on investment, although the human investment, the social return on investment, the overall development return on investment might be enormous. But again, if you're narrowly looking at it as a term of a financial cost effectiveness, because you have to repay loans, then, then this is not given. Um, so with increasing level of indebtedness, you are also restricting the fiscal space of developing countries, which also in a double whammy undermines their own ability to target um, domestic financing 
in a climate relevant and gender responsive way. So this is a huge matter of gender responsive climate finance to fight for not only more adaptation finance, but for more adaptation grant finance for a larger share of grant uh, financing overall and for reducing the loan requirements um, and, and other um, uh, requirements, for example, like a de facto co-financing requirement that we see for many activities and many climate funds. Um, lastly, um, uh, Professor Khan mentioned um, the, the, the direct access of, of local groups, including women's groups, women's organizations on the ground that really need to get their hand on financing because they are very often able with much smaller sums have a much bigger outcomes. What we need to do though for that, and this is a recurring problem, and I mentioned that really briefly in my presentation, that they are structural impediments within the climate funds. There is a huge risk misperception and kind of tilted risk appetite within climate funds where funders and particularly developed country board members are willing to take huge risk, huge risk with large scale, particularly private sector led uh, funded activities, like for example, the private equity Green Cross equity fund that was just approved for, by the GCF for, for India, but are very, very reluctant to take the risk of the small strand uh, small scale devolved grant provision to local groups. Um, and this has to change. We need to be willing to take big risks with small sums of devolved climate finance directly accessible, particularly to local groups, women's groups, community groups. Um, and we need to be more demanding of what we like to see from private sector leveraged finance, if they are accepting public money that comes with obligations, include a, including gender equality implementation obligations, and we need to hold them accountable for that. So thank you very much for the comments. As I said, I think they provide a very nice uh, rounding up of, of, of some um, of the initial remarks that I provided. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lian. It was wonderful. You have been so generous with your responses. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to just give you a couple of minutes of rest. And I would like to ask a few questions to um, uh, our, our panelists. So, uh, Marina, you uh, you also you in your paper you have pointed a little bit about the adaptive capacity. Uh, I happened to uh, go through your uh, work and. Uh, since even the fifth uh, assessment report of the IPCC has also mentioned about strengthening the adapt adaptive capacity of the you know, people of the institutions in uh, you know combating climate change, but they have also mentioned about um, the constraints. Some of the key constraints are you know, financing and also economic constraints, which is the key to uh, moving uh, moving towards. Um, you know, better, better combating climate change. So uh, what do you think uh, would, would be an appropriate response be? Whether, um, for example, if GCF is there, should it be applicable more for adaptation or whether it should be more for mitigation or whether there should be a um, convergence? So if you could respond to that. Thank you. Um, thanks, yes. I think I think this is very interconnected. So what forms a capacity is presence of enabling factors or absence of constraining factors, right? So this is, um, I think the gender equality paper is a good way to look at it because it presents gender inequality exactly as an obstacle to towards adaptation in very plain terms. If half of the population is undercapacitated in terms of access to resources, this spills over on the society as a whole and therefore represents um, a barrier or a constraint to adaptation. So removing this um, enables or, or enhances adaptive capacity. So conceptually, this is where, where we were coming from. Um, on, of course, both 
adaptation and mitigation are important to, to go to the, go to to the second question. All of you here on the panel will have been in the debate for much longer than me to to also know that um, adaptation has been a bit of a taboo for for the longest time, or it wasn't on equal footing as mitigation because it would have um, the, the concern was that that uh, too much emphasis on adaptation would distract from mitigation. But I guess with the development of of scientific projections, we thought that we cannot avoid talking about adaptation anymore. But I think it's very important to stay careful in this debate to never present adaptation and mitigation as sub as substitutes, but only as complements. And I think we have enough of scientific evidence and I share your concern, Leanne, totally. And I was able to follow a little bit the, the outcome of the last GCF board meeting and, and absurdity of, of rejecting um, aid because uh, a country doesn't have climate data because it doesn't have a weather station to begin with, which is an indicator also of, of development. So, um, but I think we know uh, on the other hand, we know enough and we know um, where adaptation actions should be prioritized and, and directly funded. So this, this is extremely interesting for me. I come from, from, the, from the side where um, more data is always better, um, but I also see how, how this can serve as a trap if we have disproportionate data in one aspect and not in, in one area and not enough in, in another, how this this could be a trap, so I would be very, very interested in exploring how how research best serves um, best serves ensuring um, climate resilient development and not make things more difficult. Great, so good. Thank you so much, uh, Marina. Uh, Dr. Bhar, uh, you uh, you have an expertise in gender responsive budgeting. Uh, so, how do you see gender responsive budgeting in climate change scenarios from the perspectives of uh, Indian states and also the nation as a whole? What do you think the negotiation position of India should be in uh, in this uh, in this direction? Currently, uh, the uh, National cap uh, capital is is actually taking some steps on it. And uh, am I audible? Yeah. So uh, they are taking some steps on it. However, uh, as I that's why that that was my query to them that if uh, sex seg desegregated data is not there, not all uh, 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 discussions will be okay. Uh, doing away with it because after a point they will always want to see that what was the cost effect and that creates a huge problem when you don't have a, uh, overall uh, information and baseline definitely does help so in india uh, when it comes to because as you know i've been working with the subnationals on implementing the grb across the uh, uh, forum and this was adopted i think uh, almost now 10, 10, 15 years now in India, but uh, it is still in the nascent stage where many states, subnationals are still adopting. I am part of one of the subnationals, uh, I'll, I won't be taking the name of it, but uh, which has just recently last year adopted it. And it, of course, it is doing a good work when it, when it has uh, finally adopted the mandate. However, their understanding on these parameters are very limited. So if you are going to, like as uh, Professor Khan was uh, pointing out the nuances of these things. So when we talk to the uh, respective departments on these aspects, they generally are very particular about, uh, uh, very uh, stoic about that, how is it going to benefit? They, the, they do not understand the overall picture. And most so, more so when we bring in the gender element of it, because for them that is a secondary or probably a subsidiary uh, aspect. And that's why when uh, Leanne in her presentation has centered it, it really gave me a lot of hope and I was really excited about it. And that's why I acknowledged it. Because in most of these discussions, gender is seriously a sub, sub element. It is not a, a center element. 
even in uh, you take up any of the conversation they they generally uh, nowadays because it is a mandate of the sdg that you have to touch up on all the 17 parameters so gender is one of those tick marks that uh, people take up and that's why when uh, uh, climate or for that matter uh, even livelihood and uh, uh, as uh, dr khan has rightly pointed out that uh, the nobel uh, laureate got the award but it was definitely because of those uh, community uh, women who actually worked on it so I totally totally uh, support it and thank you for pointing out and uh, raising these uh, aspect crit critical aspects on uh, gender and Leanne, I can't help it. I am a UN women person. So automatically it comes to me that uh, whenever I'm talking about it, I always refer to the reports and to the numbers. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. But uh, uh, Simi, in India, there is progress. But as, as every one of us know, in every country, there are some limitations because of the political uh, climate of it or for many other factors, even bureaucracy is no less in this conversation. So when you are able to kind of negotiate with the uh, respective uh, departments and the governments and able to meet, like in my, in my particular case, I, I can very rightly point out that almost, uh, uh, because it's a two year uh, project that ADB is uh, implementing, and I'm handholding the subnational on it. And because we were able to simplify the step, because one thing that we also understand that when we talk about gender, half of the population on the other side of the table does not understand what we are talking about. So we also have to simplify the language for them to understand and then adopt by step. So in this particular case, we broke it down to as simple steps as possible. And we literally uh, handheld them and spoon fed them that uh, let's do this thing first and then go to the second step. So when uh, now it is almost um, 11, uh -huh, 11 months now, we have already achieved an almost 70%. If I go by the LFA language of it, uh, we have already completed 70% of the uh, output that we required. But now I am more focused about the sustainability element of it, because once they do it, they will be uh, making it as an uh, example, and they will be having a lot many award ceremonies and everything on that, and then they will forget in the next 10 years. So that is where the sustainability element, and uh, that's why uh, in uh, Leanne's presentation also, I was asking on that parameter that how do you maintain, how do you ensure that sustainability element? Because that is where after implementation, the challenge comes in. Because if you are not able to sustain it, all your effort that you have put during whichever uh, program or project you are associated with, you realize that over a period of time, it has been kind of uh, futile, for a lack of word, I'm just saying that. But that is where uh, in, our, in our strategies, we try to bring in the sustainability element, and that's why uh, although the uh, output is very clearly specified on uh, uh, various indicators, we put a lot of emphasis on the um, uh, sustenance element because once uh, these kind of um, uh, big projects go out of that uh, program area, next, we don't know when it will be continued. So in, in this particular case, GRB, I'm trying to institutionalize the GRB in their state policies so that when, when we go out of it, because UN Women obviously will be there for a limited time period. So after we move out of here, this becomes a part and parcel of their uh, system. That is where I believe that in, in any conversation around gender or for that matter, any other uh, change uh, strategies that we talk about, we need to ensure that not only is the implementation uh, ensured, but also the sustainability of it is made sure. Otherwise, all the hard work that we do falls flat. So that will be my submission to me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was uh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Professor um, Nazan uh, Khan, uh, very quickly to you, you have been at the highest level of multilateral negotiations. 
and I am really intrigued to know your perspectives on what can we really expect out of the COP26 in terms of uh, gender responsive climate finance. Any breakthrough? Quickly, if you could respond. Yeah, oh, very quick. Yeah, uh, not much, frankly, because you know, international uh, international diplomacy is kind of an extension of uh, national policy. So. I'm not very optimistic because very, very few parties, as Leon has referred to, include gender perspective in their NAP or NDCs or other national communications. So once developing countries include this gender dimension of climate finance more and more in our national communications, national documents, then we su submit to the UNFCC Secretariat, then international negotiations will consider, you know. So uh, they will not take up by themselves as such. So GCF or AF, whatever we can name those uh, funders, bilateral or anything, it depends first on the national approach. If we strongly argue in our submissions of the gender related climate finance to be strengthened, then only it will be aggregated internationally. It will be analyzed by uh, researchers like Leanne or myself sometimes, you know, and then they will consider, they will factor uh, in the negotiation process. But here is the serious gap. Our developing country is still, most of the countries still are not attuned to promoting gender with all their heart and mind. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Professor Khan, for being for that candid assessment. Thank you. So I would now uh, let uh, Leanne to have her final word. And uh, if I could just add, uh, add one question, um, does the rejoining of the US in the Paris Agreement offer a silver lining, according to you, in the gender responsive climate financing? And any responses that you would like to have uh, based on the discussions? Yes. yes um... Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Simi, and, and, and thanks to, to, to everybody. Um, on, on the question specifically, so first of all, it's good that the US are back in the Paris Agreement. There is no doubt about it. Um, and it's good that the um, Biden administration has made um, climate really a focus of all of its activities. It has also shown um, its interest in, in um, uh, bringing uh, gender more broadly into discourses um, in the US, including, for example, in some of the discussions right now um, that we have on infrastructure, which very much has a, a, a care focused infrastructure, which has a huge um, uh, gender uh, component. Um, so I think that acknowledgement um, overarching is there. Um, I'm not sure yet, um, although I hope that advocacy of groups that are situated in the United States can actually uh, do, do a quick push there, yeah. that the, uh, how, how gender responsive um, the climate finance contribution of the United States is. First of all, the climate finance contribution has to be significantly upscaled. Um, we know that the, um, that the United States are in arrears, for example, in the Green Climate Fund. Um, we also know, obviously, that whatever has been announced so far is way beyond what a, what a fair share contribution to climate finance is, and we don't have to go into that. But I'm thinking, again, um, from, from I, I think there is the more procedural approach and there is the larger political big picture. And on the larger political big picture, the significant upscaling of climate finance through the provision of grant, oopsie, of grant adaptation finance, uh, for example, if the United States were to be very supportive of financing or considering financing and financing approaches for loss and damage, this will have obviously a huge human rights based <laughs> impact, including gender impact. On gender responsiveness of financial provisions specifically, um, bilaterally, uh, so for example, through bilateral climate finance that the US uh, uh, is implementing via USAID, for example, it already plays a role, could probably play a bigger role. I like to um, see what uh, Professor Khan has pointed out, a commensurate 
taking up of gender as an important dis an, an important component of the climate finance discourse and negotiations in developed countries as well, and particularly in some of the leading countries like um, the US, like Germany, like the UK. Um, I think that would get us a lot further because what we see way too often is that what I described basically with the problematic um, of gender, that it's seen as an add-on, not really shaping how we fund or what is funded, but basically making those decisions first and then trying to accommodate uh, some gender consideration. And this is obviously very different from an approach that puts a people-centered, human rights-centered, gender-responsive focus um, to financing from, from the very onset. So that would be my hope. Um, there is a long way to go, but I'm hopeful. Again, I've engaged in that for more than 10 years. And as you could see on the slide that I provided, which shows steps taken in the course of the, the last 10 years in both the Prada UNFCCC um, uh, uh, framework, as well as multilateral climate funds, there is movement. Is the movement there fast enough? No. Is it comprehensive enough? No. Um, do we need to push for much more? Absolutely. We won't stop. But hopefully, at least the direction is unstoppable. So I leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that note of optimism. Let us all keep our fingers crossed. So thank you very much. And uh, would uh, our panelists have anything to say towards the end? Or uh, can we just move to, can we just conclude? Marina, uh, Professor Khan, Dr. Ghar. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much. And it was really a delight and a delight to learn a lot and very insightful presentations and responses from all our distinguished panelists. Thank you so much. And I would uh, now like to uh, give the formal vote of thanks now. So on behalf of uh, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, Gender Impact Studies Center, uh, I, I really uh, extend my warm and uh, gratitude, warm gratitude to all, all of you this evening joining from different parts of the world, especially uh, our speaker, Ms. Leanne Schlatik. It was such a wonderful time. And um, uh, I hope that we'll keep in touch and we'll uh, continue to learn uh, by your insights and your leadership. And uh, I would like to also thank uh, Ms. Marina uh, who joined us at a very short notice, but definitely you know, we, we have to keep interacting and learn more from your work that you are doing amazing work. And I echo Dr. Sangamitra's uh, wishes, best wishes for your PhD. I also thank Dr. Sangamitra Dhar. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, accepting our invitation and joining us and providing your views. And Professor Mizan Khan for your really candid and straightforward assessment of uh, the discussion that uh, happened today. So thank you so much. And I wish you all a very good evening and good day. And please take care of yourselves. We hope that we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a thank good you, day. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.